Hello everyone, welcome to the program tonight, the health of our justice system. It's the least tangible but possibly the most defining test of a fair society. Under the microscope is the work of the former chief of the South Australian Forensic Centre responsible for crucial evidence in a string of major criminal investigations. Incredibly, the head man, Dr Colin Mannock, lacked the proper qualifications for the job and although authorities knew of his shortcomings, little was done to guard against critical errors being made. And senior doctors and lawyers now say errors were made in many cases, including the controversial trials which led to Henry Keogh being jailed for the murder of his young fiancée Anna Jane Chaney. We will reveal startling evidence in that case that has never been tested, as well as the breakdown in procedures over the past 30 years that has lawyers and politicians calling for a royal commission into the justice system. Rowan Wen has this report. It's quite clear that justice has not been done. This has been going on for eight years now. Something's not right. While much of this story focuses on a controversial Adelaide murder trial, it really goes much deeper. It goes to the heart of whether our criminal justice system gives us blind justice or simply turns a blind eye to injustice. We all need to believe in the justice system. And it is the follow-up punch in South Australian Speaker Peter Lewis's call for a royal commission. I want these um, allegations to be properly examined and the truth to be determined. It was never just about the dubious sale of pedophile judge Peter Liddy's assets or even the decades of silence which covered for his appalling behaviour. It astounds me that for starters that the courts can let him even let um, children stay over in the courthouses. I mean, someone must have known that there was a magistrate staying in these courthouses with kids. But rather, a litany of failures in the system that stretch back over 30 years. I don't know whether it's just uh, through friendships and, and the old boys' network or... Um, I just don't know. It's a system that tolerates incompetence and turns a blind eye to errors and injustice, at times sending innocent people to jail while allowing the true villains to escape punishment. People like myself and my family, we're not looking for sympathy, we just want the truth to come out. It's been eight years since attractive young Adelaide lawyer Anna Jane Chaney was found dead in her bath. And almost seven years since her bank manager fiancé Henry Keogh was sent to jail for her murder. Do you believe that Anna Jane Chaney was actually murdered? No, I don't. I don't think there's any sufficient evidence to indicate that the, uh, a crime took place at all. There's a strong body of evidence to show that uh, he is not guilty of the charge. Almost every um, government department that was involved in the investigation um, failed to um, do their job properly. Solicitor Valerie Armfield was a colleague of Anna Jane's who became fascinated with the Keogh matter while investigating another case. I can't believe that so many people didn't do their, their job. Convinced that the courts got it horribly wrong, Valerie contacted Kevin Borick QC and former Adelaide Uni Associate Professor of Law Dr Bob Moles. Our justice system needs to be fixed. At the centre of their concerns is this man, Dr Colin Manick, the prosecution's expert witness and startling evidence which challenges almost everything that Manock told the court. That the evidence given by uh, Dr Manock in the Keogh case was wrong and in lots of other cases was wrong. Dr Colin Manock was the state's director of forensic pathology for almost 30 years but amazingly he never had any qualifications in the crucial field of histopathology. So he hadn't done the training but they gave him the gig? He was given the job and then there were some notes in uh, one of the earlier proceedings where they said, we knew we were taking a bit of a risk because we were appointing somebody without proper qualifications. But it was our view that he would get the qualifications after he was appointed. But after getting the top job, Manick failed to do that further training, never becoming a qualified forensic specialist. With little more than a basic medical degree and hands-on experience, Manick gave evidence in trial after trial much of which now is being savaged by other pathologists who are vastly better qualified. In my view, what happened in Keogh was a miscarriage of justice. Just one astounding example of his failings came to light in 1992. Attending this suspicious death, Dr Manick concluded the victim must have accidentally struck his head and died of a brain haemorrhage. Later, a bullet hole and a bullet were discovered in the man's head, 
something our chief forensic pathologist simply missed at the time. One view of Manick's evidence in the Keogh case now raises similar concerns. If I were describing this evidence to the jury at, a, at the trial of Keogh, I would have said it was incompetent and unprofessional. Just prior to Manick being assigned to the Keogh investigation, alarming questions were being raised by doctors and police over Manick's findings on the deaths of three small children. Our head pathologist reported they died innocently of bronchopneumonia, but he was to be proven hopelessly wrong. And an independent pathologist said there's no evidence of bronchopneumonia at all. A coronial inquest into Manick's evidence on the baby's cases was being conducted at the exact same time as the Keogh trials. And in fact, the coroner had prepared this report, which was highly critical of Manick, during the second Keogh trial. But he didn't release it. The coroner takes the view that he ought not to release his report, disclosing the extent of Dr Manick's incompetence, until after the trial. He says it might interfere with the trial. If the jury had known Dr Manick's evidence had been so heavily criticised in those cases, would they have ever convicted Henry Keogh? Eventually, Keogh got 25 years. Then, two days later, the coroner released his findings into the battered babies. But thanks to Manick's incompetence, no one has ever been charged for the infant deaths. In his defence, Manick claimed he wasn't an expert in child pathology. So why would the coroner appoint Dr Manick to do the autopsy of Anashini when he'd previously had extensive evidence over the previous 12 months that Dr Manick wasn't doing his job properly? During the Keogh trial, our State Director of Public Prosecutions, Paul Rofe, relied heavily on Manick as an expert witness. The fact that Manick's reputation was in tatters was never raised by anyone. He was a senior forensic pathologist in this state. Yet he had no training in pathology or histopathology, and you were still confident enough to use him as an expert witness? Yes, he, um, he had vast experience. Um, but just because you do a job often doesn't mean you do it well? No, that's possibly true. Paul Rofe prosecuted Henry Keogh in the two murder trials, the first ending with a hung jury. This whole process has been so upsetting to the Cheney family, and, uh, and it's just being uh, prolonged by these sorts of... We certainly don't want to upset the Cheney family, but if there's two victims here and one of them's in jail, shouldn't we be looking at that? Oh, yes. I, I, as I said, I'm not afraid of media scrutiny, but, I mean, I think it's got to be properly based. But our investigation has revealed a litany of errors, failures in the system extending to the coroner, the police, the DPP, and, of course, Dr Colin Manick. So what did all these people upon whom we rely get so wrong? I liken it to an archaeological dig. It's been there all the time, but it was a matter of bringing it out, looking at it and piecing it together. Put simply, the evidence was contaminated long before any proper investigation was done. Contrary to required procedures, police failed to secure the scene. Well, the Police Forensic Science Manual states quite clearly that where um, there's a sudden or unexplained death, the scene should be cordoned off. Well, in the case of Henry Keogh, that certainly didn't happen. In fact, more than a dozen people entered Anna Jane's bedroom and bathroom that night. Uh, a police officer was appointed to stand guard at the door, but when family and friends turned up and said, we're family or friends or something of that sort, he said, apparently, it's all right, you can go in. And then they went in and walked around, and this was what we'd call contamination of the scene. But apparently Paul Rofe doesn't seem overly concerned by this lapse in the basic rules of investigation. The death didn't, I guess, to those attending, wasn't regarded as suspicious at the time. But no cause of death had been established? No, that's right. So it should have been cordoned off? Well, it would have been better if it had been. Furthermore, the body was tampered with. Police photos show Anna Jane's hair was combed and makeup had been applied to her face. You can simply see the two photographs. You can see the difference between the two photographs and nobody has made any reference in any statement to anything related to that. Paul Rove says he didn't know about that, but adds it really doesn't matter anyway. But it does indicate that somebody's been dealing with the body. That's your interpretation. I, there may well, be how else does she get made up and they get her hair done? I've got no idea. But, I mean, it may be someone who's just out of respect for, for a dead person... You know, yeah. Which is fine, except it does indicate that somebody has been dealing with the body. It may have been the coroner's assistant, I don't know. Making her up at the scene of the death? 
Look, I honestly don't know, but it doesn't concern me. The body then went to the morgue where Dr Mannock's post-mortem, according to accepted procedures, should have been witnessed by investigating police. But no police were ever present. Wouldn't it be a concern? Again, I'd probably ask why that hadn't happened and uh, if the explanation wasn't sufficient, then I'd uh, be concerned. But... but to date, that's a question you haven't asked? Well, I haven't been told this before. The next and more critical breakdown in procedures occurred with the autopsy. Dr Manick was the only pathologist to examine the body. It's a breach that's further amplified by this amazing admission from our Director of Public Prosecutions when questioned by Today Tonight. Was it unfortunate that Manick was the only one who got to see the body? No, as I said, that was the established procedure at the time, in my experience. And, uh... But it goes against the police forensic guidelines. Well, I haven't seen those and I'm not aware of them. Well, here they are. Paul Rofe later called us to say that no one has heard of the police forensic guidelines. But when we offered to send him our copy, he declined. If you use um, bad science, you're going to get problems. But the lapses in procedure went from bad to worse. Anna Jane's body was released by the coroner for cremation the very day her death was declared a major crime. No one had examined the body but Colin Manick, and now no one else ever would. It is not correct that other pathologists um, who gave evidence at the trial reviewed his work. All they had to go on was the information supplied to them by Manock. So how reliable was that information? Central to Manock's finding was the way he says Anna Jane drowned. But as you'll soon learn, a controversial video reconstruction shows the flaws in that theory. Uh, which this is the bathroom in which uh, Anna Cheney was found. Um, uh, now, coming up after the break, more in that case, including the evidence which challenges that a murder ever took place, and the views of Keo's former wife Sue. When you stand up after a warm bath, especially if you had a glass of two of wine, um, you can become lightheaded, and you could faint. When Henry Keogh was found guilty of murder, a number of crucial matters played a role. The first of which is what really happened on the tragic night his fiancée was found dead. The cause of death put forward by Dr Manock at the trials was challenged, but never as vigorously as now. Lawyers investigating the case have put the theory to the test and they say the results just can't be ignored. Rowan Wen continues the story. The muscles in a leg are much stronger than fingertip grip. A lot has been said about that video reenactment filmed by Bob Moles, Kevin Borick, QC and Valerie Armfield inside Henry Keogh's former bathroom. They conducted the reenactment to test Dr Manick's theory on how Anna Jane drowned. Dr Manick was saying that the assailant came in on the right hand side, reached underneath the right leg, grabbed the left leg with the fingertips and forced it back over the head whilst pushing down on the head at the same time. The specialists tell us that it simply can't be done. Um, we are now going to try a couple of um, various scenarios based on the evidence given by Dr Manick. The video reenactment is too distressing to show, but it is important evidence. Because watching the tape, it's clear it would be virtually impossible to drown an adult woman in the manner described by Dr Manick. It's also evident when you watch the tape that Anna Jane would have been able to fight back, kicking with her right leg and hitting with both arms. But of course Henry had no signs of injury. To prove his point in the trial, Manick relied on these photos to show what he thought were small bruises on Anna Jane's ankle, made by Keogh's fingers. You'll notice there are no colour photographs. Previously, we, we do know that colour photos had been used in trials. Yes. But not for this one. That's correct. They went with the black and white. Yes. That must cause you some suspicion. It causes me very grave concern because, of course, we're talking about evidence of bruising. And since then, other pathologists have checked the remaining tissue samples and in their opinions, they weren't bruises at all. What was said to be a bruise was not a bruise and that destroys the prosecution case. So if it wasn't murder, is there another explanation? Well, one theory is that Anna Jane simply slipped and hit her head. When you stand up after a warm bath, especially if you had a glass or two of wine, um, you can become lightheaded and you could faint. And if you banged your head as you fainted, um, you could then end up in the water 
and, uh, and you could drown. Another theory that Anna Jane had suffered some kind of allergic reaction, something not explored at either trial. In court it was said many, many times that she was a fit and healthy person. But we know that she had over 30 medical consultations in the previous three years. Depends on who you are, I suppose. I mean, I don't go to the doctor very often, but people I know would probably go 36 times in a year. Some of those visits were to an allergy specialist, and pathologists have recently pointed to what could be an injection mark or a bee sting on Anna Jane's leg, which could suggest a reaction to some medication or an insect bite. If she has a pinprick or a mark at that location, it could be a bee sting, it could be an injection, it could be all sorts of things, but it should be explained. It's a possibility that's never been raised before. I can only think of you know things that are in my comprehension or that are brought to my attention, and that certainly wasn't one. Much of this received little attention from Keogh's defence counsel in the first two trials or the first appeal. Do you remember that birthday? <laughs> my hair's different. Sue Keogh is Henry Keogh's first wife. It's made lots of mistakes in his life, but that makes him human. He's not a murderer. It's a huge leap from making silly decisions or silly choices and moving to murder. I just know he's not a murderer. For the last eight years, she says she's believed in her ex-husband's innocence. You don't believe that he was responsible for Anne's death? No, I've never, ever believed that. I've taken the children in to visit they were only 8, 11 and 13 when it first started. If I thought for a moment that he was responsible for her death, there's no way I would have let them had any contact with him. The family argues that in the end, Henry was convicted because of mistakes he'd made in the past, including the much detailed stories of infidelity, which formed a part of the trial. Some of it is true, to be honest. Like, I mean, he made mistakes, he obviously had an affair, but there's, there's more to him than that. Much too was made of five insurance policies Henry took out for Anna by forging her signature, worth more than a million dollars. And while on the surface it looks very suspicious, his former wife says it wasn't unusual and alone didn't make him a murderer. Well, while we were married, as a matter of convenience, Henry always signed papers for me and he had my permission to do, it, to do that and I had no problem with that. It was just a matter of convenience. Evidence was also presented that Henry had taken out the policies to keep his insurance agencies active. He'd recently taken up a new job with a firm of financial planners and was very concerned that within the next few months it may not work out and he might have to go out on his own. So therefore, why not put a policy through each of the agencies which might encourage the life insurance companies to keep his agencies open rather than close them off. There was also evidence given at the trials, though disputed, that Anna Jane was well aware those policies existed. There was one question that said, how much do you spend on life insurances? And she put beside that $36 a week, which is roughly speaking the cost of the five life insurance policies. The jury, however, didn't see it that way. Keogh's new defence counsel did raise Manick's failures in the second appeal and their petition to the High Court, but Paul Rove countered by saying the forensic evidence was not the deciding factor, an argument accepted by the court. I think it was a combination of a lot of evidence that was led at trial. By this time, the die was cast, and whatever the truth is, a system that flouts its own rules and tolerates incompetence must surely leave us with lingering doubts. There must be an independent inquiry, not an inquiry by the people who are involved, but an independent inquiry to see if what we're saying has substance. Recently, interest in the Keogh case has led to a public campaign to have the matter reinvestigated. Meanwhile, Bob Moles and the other lawyers have presented the Governor with a petition calling for a Royal Commission into this case and the scores of other controversial cases in which Mannix evidence played a key role. I have probably 20 to 25 cases where we have very grave concerns about the nature of the evidence that was given. I didn't come here to make friends or enemies. I came here to make improvements and I see this now as an improvement that has to be made. And if the government is looking for comfort from independent Bob Such, well, he too has expressed serious misgivings that the system has let us down. As for the rest of us, well, the least we deserve is to know that justice will be done in every case. I think we should all be concerned about what's been happening. 
Now, in compiling that report, we attempted to meet with Henry Keogh, but were refused by the authorities concerned. We also asked to speak with Dr Manock, the coroner, Keogh's defence counsel at the trials, and the Cheney family. All declined.